So, uh, welcome to the Fishbowl Q&A. Uh, it's going to be super, super simple. You're going to ask us questions. We are going to repeat the question so that people watching on the camera can answer it, uh, can know what it is. Uh, yeah, if they answer it, that would be great. Okay. And then we're going to have a go at answering it. Um, we may or may not give you answers that you like, but we are going to try. Um, but before we do that, maybe it would be a good idea to introduce the people who are here on the stage. Um, and I'll begin with myself. I am Simon Stewart. I'm the lead of the Selenium project and the creator of WebDriver. Um, and I work as a software engineer at Facebook. And uh, I am uh, Jim Evans. Uh, I work at salesforce.com and I am the uh, owner of the .NET language bindings and the Internet Explorer driver. Yeah, my name is uh, Andreas Tolfsen, uh, known as ATO on the RC channel. Um, Starting to accumulate quite a bit of history with the Selenium project. Um, uh, started out in, in 2009, actually, uh, when I wrote the original Opera driver, uh, whilst I was working with Opera. Uh, since then, I've moved on, and I'm now working for Mozilla. So i am kept working on drivers. Uh, <laughs> seems to be a pattern here. And uh, now I'm working on a tool called Marionette, which, is, um, which some of you may have heard of, which is supposed to become the replacement for Firefox driver, which is also going to be working, which is also going to work on devices. So um, yeah, that's a part of what I'm doing at Mozilla. Uh, hello, my name is Dima Kovalenko. I work at Groupon. I am the one who tends to ask the silliest questions in IRC, and then um, whenever Simon gives me a sarcastic answer, I have to go and find the answer myself. Uh, that way I can give a more polite answer to whoever else has the uh, same question as me. And I'm Julian Harty, and I've probably been on the project for the longest time and written the least code. I have the honor of having most of my code deprecated. <laughs> we'll delete it soon. Oh, and deleted, yes. But yet I'm still here. So I think we're ready for the first question from the floor. Um, there's a microphone there, so just raise your hand and someone will run a microphone to you. Um, there's a gentleman there in the front. Why don't you shout out and I'll just repeat your question. Uh, first of all, thank you for hosting in India. We look forward, and that's an easy <laughs> Thank you. And um, uh, I know in India, if you look at the market specifically for uh, web driver is growing rapidly than what we anticipated. Um, so interestingly, we would hopefully have more participants to work with you to make the web driver three and four accelerator. Uh, that would be one of our wish and the goal. Uh, but I also wanted to ask a very uh, question because we are mostly customer driven market in India and the customers are driving us to use web driver more and more. Uh, but certainly we see the releases obviously in a kind of flows not in the way we want it to be. Uh, is there an opportunity we make it? I understand it's open source, so I cannot ask more. Uh, but certainly is there an opportunity to make the releases a little more uh, supportive so that we can deliver more to our customers? So can I just ask, when you say supported, do you mean like a regular release schedule? Uh, yeah, regular release with the futures. I, I understand you promised in... 3.0 last year, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, went on to, <laughs> I went on to promise to our customers what's coming, yeah. and, and uh, we, we, we are anticipating more. So, so is there a kind of promise that we can work with you to deliver? Okay, so um, it's an interesting question, right? Uh, because as a, as a user-facing project, the APIs that Selenium has offered have been remarkably stable since uh, 2011, right? Um, as we move forward to 3.0, the only change we're going to see is the removal of the deprecated Selenium RC APIs. The WebDriver APIs are going to remain. And when we move forward to 4.0, those same APIs are going to remain in place as well. So customer facing, really, our release schedule doesn't matter too much because the APIs that people are using are fairly solid, um, fairly immovable, and the changes we make tend to be additive in that we tend to add methods rather than remove them at this point. Um, having said that, it would be really nice if we 
had enough organization to be able to like go, wow, it suddenly got really bright in here. Um, <laughs> it'd be really nice if we were organized enough to go like, oh yeah, we're definitely gonna release on the you know, 3rd of December version 3.0. Um, it's not the 3rd of December. <laughs> it will now be the 3rd of December, right? That's how these things work, right? After categorically saying it definitely won't happen, that is what will happen. Um, so yeah, I mean, the story to give to users and, and to customers is one of stability and continuity. Um, on the back end, there's going to be a certain amount of hard work that we're going to invest in making sure that sort of the migration from two to three is relatively smooth, and from three to four is as smooth as possible as well, which is why we're going to have the last releases of three be backward and forward compatible, so that you can do a slow staged migration rather than sort of coming in one day, doing an update and going like, the entire world seems to have broken, which is something we definitely don't want to happen, right? We're very conscious of the fact that people make this huge investment and that having stability and reliability is, is super important. So that's the message I would give to, to the customers. Um, is there anything else that anyone else wanted to add? So I think, um, uh, I mean, with also pushing the driver implementations over to the side of the browser vendors, we're also going to, uh, I think, see a, an increase in stability that way. Because currently, for example, uh, in the current Selenium version, uh, I think many of you might know, but Firefox is broken, right, with the release of Firefox 32. And uh, that's been a continuous problem. Ever, every time uh, that Firefox is making a release, uh, the Selenium project with, with its volunteers need to sort of stand on standby to, 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 to do a new release, a new compile. And uh, uh, moving, shifting that responsibility over to us, uh, to, to Mozilla, as, uh, uh, as, as their responsibility of maintaining uh, the driver part which sits underneath the WebDriver, I think is also going to sort of help that stability. Things aren't suddenly going to start breaking if you do a sudo apt upgrade on your Linux box, for example. Oh, yes. Uh, introduce yourself, Santi. Introduce myself. Yes. All right. Uh, my name is Santiago suarez Ordonias. Uh, I've been a committer to the project for a while now, and <laughs> by now, I don't really know what my contribution is. I'm, I'm definitely helping with the continuous integration. We are, uh, mainly from my Sauce Labs role, I am in charge of maintaining the browser options that the Selenium project has available to their continuous integration. So things like the latest Firefox being available for the Selenium project to test on is uh, crucial, and we are in charge of helping out with that. Um, so that's it. Question over Hi. here in front. Here. Oh. Oh, oh. I am small. There you go. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my question is, uh, I'm Mahesh. Okay, first I will introduce myself. So my question is, why uh, WebDriver opens new tab link in new window? I'm sorry, why does it open a new window? Yes, the, the links which are open in new tab. Instead of a new will, tab, why does it open a new window? Why it is in new window? It's a perfectly valid question. Um, you have to remember that the, I mean, originally, when, when the WebDriver project started, uh, new tabs within the same browser window, top level frame, pretty much didn't exist. You would always get a new window. And the other important thing to remember is that from the point of view of the application being automated, there is no difference between a new tab and a new top-level window. Uh, the, the, it's, it's, a, it's a new top-level browsing context in the, in the words of the World Wide Web Consortium spec language. It's a new top-level browsing context. It, the only difference that it makes is aesthetically as you're watching the test run and I'm not sure that I would care that much about that as long as I'm testing the functionality really is what I would care about. The reason why it does it in Firefox driver is because I couldn't figure out how to switch to a different tab <laughs> when they introduced tabs. <laughs> and so I made it open a new window. <laughs> if someone wants to send me a patch to make it less lame, I'd really, really appreciate that. I might even give you a hug. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, this is why I asked this question is you have the, we have the option to open 
the context click uh, from context click we can open in new tab right so uh, once i tried with a new tab but i was not able to switch to new tab so that's why i asked this question thank you uh to add to that uh question though is it even possible in Firefox and Chrome to open up a new tab within the same process and have the new tab open up with a new profile? Or, uh, no. Exactly, and so part of the reason it would open up in a new window is if you try to run two tests at the same time, each browser would have its own profile and you cannot do that in two tabs. Yeah, um, that's, that's also because there are two different browser sessions uh, in place, but, um, uh, but the reason we can't really talk about the concept of a tab in Selenium is because the web uh, as such doesn't really have a concept of a tab. And you also have the complexity of, of mobile browsers uh, in which, or kiosk browsers, which in some cases don't even have tabs. Or they might have tabs, but they might be in, like tabs in a different form than we used to on, on, um, on, uh, on the desktop. Hi. Um, my question is, uh as a representative of this commu the community, you know, what are the common, most common questions uh, uh, people ask you, request, and uh, do you have any answers in the recent future to, for, for example, uh, one, one question that I've been asked a lot ab about uh, um, the drawback of Selenium, they say, oh, it's slow because I have to, every request is a, a different HTTP request and I can, Piggy bag is uh, to bulk it together. So, do you have uh, any spe things that in the last year uh, a lot of the, uh, requests from the community for something specific? Uh, okay. So, I mean, jocularly, uh, HTTP status codes <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> it's a huge long thread in the bug tracker and several blog entries by numerous committers. Um, more seriously. The question I get all the, uh, fairly frequently, and it happened earlier today, is like, I'm using implicit timeouts, and I'm writing library code, and I want to set the implicit timeout to some value, and then I want to restore it when you leave my code. Um, and my answer to that is like, well, I'm not gonna give you a mechanism for getting hold of a timeout. Um, if a user has configured something in a particular way and they pass it to you, it, it's a little bit rude to just tinker with it and, and not use it the way it's meant to be used. And so, like, resetting those timeouts is, is something that I don't think is a great idea. Um, the other thing as well is that the project as a whole is, like, we added implicit timeouts because people aren't aware of, like, where page transitions are or where um, they're expecting JavaScript to be executing. Um, more sophisticated t testers who are more familiar with their application should be using explicit timeouts. Like, implicit timeouts are there as a mechanism to get you over a hump and get you started. They're not there as a, as a crutch to lean upon. Um, as a future change, uh, we are doing a new Actions API, which tends to be the most verbose when it comes to the interactions with the browser. Um, and the Actions API, uh, which was suggested by, by Mozilla, actually, um, batches together a ser series of, of interactions that need to be performed and then sends them over the wire in one lump. Um, it's quite hard to do that in a meaningful way um, with other commands because you need to be able to go like, well, this is the command it failed on and people read stack traces, right? And the stack trace that comes like five lines too late is no use to anyone. Um, I'm sure the guys going down the line probably have their favorite questions and their favorite forthcoming feature. Um, <clears throat> seems like I get asked an awful lot about uh, status codes is one, and <laughs> one that I routinely tear my hair out about. <laughs> you can see how much it's affected me over the years. Um, JavaScript errors, being able to capture JavaScript errors on a page is a, is a feature that I get asked about a lot. Um, that's one I think we would hope that we would want to uh, encapsulate. I think we have punted on logging and error handling for the first cut of the spec, but I think that uh, level two we might take a crack at that. Um, that, speaking for the .NET bindings, the .NET bindings don't implement any of the logging things that, um, any of the logging APIs that say Java does. 
and I get a fair number of requests for that. And the reason that they don't have them, and the reason that the IE driver doesn't implement any of the things that some of the other drivers do in terms of being able to get logs is because they haven't been defined by the spec yet, uh, and I don't want to code to a moving target. So. Yeah, I mean, personally I don't think that the HTTP uh, that we have that as on top necessarily makes it that slow. I don't think that's the sort of the bottleneck here. Um, the reason we wanted to, like Simon said, um, batch, uh, batch the uh, new advanced interactions API is primarily because the new world is uh, devices, right? So uh, you have to imagine that these devices are all, all often running with quite slow uh, CPUs and uh, uh, we have to, uh, and that's also by the, by the reason for, for Firefox OS that we've chosen a TCP protocol in the back end. So actually it's not speaking HTTP directly to the phone. And um, uh, we're doing some similar tweaks for some of the other devices. Uh, it seems to be that uh, at least once a week somebody will jump into the IRC channel or send an email to the dev list um, asking for a way to loop through a ID pre-recorded test or do if statements and uh, the people who ask that question tend to not like the answer of well maybe you should just rewrite it in Ruby or Java, write it in the real language and so they then proceed to implement a hack to make a loop that is three times more complicated than Java or Ruby could have ever been. So I think that's the top of the line for me. And for me, it's probably on the mobile side of it. I, I work mainly in mobile. So people trying to understand how they can do tech. A lot of visibility into what happens when a problem comes up. Um, a very, very common question is, why did my page not load? Or why is this element not present when I waited to be? And all these timing issues can really get nailed down when you actually get the full network dump of the session. And yes, they will get you HTTP status codes as well. So Selenium is gonna support HTTP status codes. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so the login API for performance, JavaScript errors, and networking to me is one of the, one of the biggest wins. Um, writing Selenium tests is somewhat easy Debugging them when they break is really, really hard, and this will give us the visibility that uh, we need. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Anurag, and uh, my question is around uh, browser coverage. So, as an automation engineer, if I am running on my suit only on Firefox, and say not on IE, or maybe not on all the flavors of IE. Uh, then am I missing any possible issue which a customer may hit? Yeah. Ah, that wasn't the question, was it? <laughs> the question was, how can I be confident that the application I'm launching will work with my customers? I think. Yes. Yes. And running, it, running the suit on all the, uh, say, covering all the browsers and uh, their different versions is also a problem. So how can I optimize that? Yeah, so um, I'm a huge fan of just looking at data. So I've got a certain amount of time, I've got a certain number of resources that I can spend on doing my automated testing. Um, I'd probably take a look at the distribution of browser usages. There's probably like IE, Chrome, and Firefox near the top. So running in the latest version of those three will give you good coverage. At that point, it's um, worth taking a look at the bugs that are coming in and seeing whether there's a particular browser where people are seeing more issues. Like maybe it's IE7 because it's an antiquated browser and it's well out of, you know, it's, it's just ancient now with IE11 being out. And so, um, you know, you, you, you take a look at the data and, and you go like, well, if I do these three and IE7, then that will give me sufficient coverage that I'm confident that the application is working. Now you could, you know, use a service such as Source Labs or something like that to run every single test on every single variant of every single browser. But that would be a waste of your time, it would be a waste of money, it would be a waste of resources, right? So you've just got to get yourself to that point where the data says you're covering the percentage of your users that you're comfortable with covering, and the expectation being that the browsers you're not covering are the ones 
uh, are going to be sufficiently similar to the other browsers that you are using, that everything's going to be okay. Um, does anyone have anything to add? Uh, one more thing is to look at your own server logs, because the real world might have 12% IE5 users or whatever it is, IE7 users, but your world may be different. Maybe you're working for the engine train company or the visa company who seem to like IE8, for instance. I speak from experience. So in your case, look at your server logs and you'll start to build up patterns. And if you notice that no one goes to the order complete using IE8, maybe that's something to look at. Whereas you see that page is being hit by all the other browsers successfully. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Hari Krishna. So uh, my question is, uh, does WebDriver implemented on Java code has any enmity with uh, .NET applications? Uh, because I'm sure many of them, you know, the common thing uh, issue that we observe normally is uh, whenever uh, some click doesn't work, say they just say, okay, use some JavaScript executor. So is there any particular uh, bug or something related to click? Uh, wherein actually clicking a button doesn't work and we have to go for a JavaScript execute in the code? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't... So, yeah, generally, uh, uh, most of the cases, uh, when many of times I observe that uh, when I actually try to use um, uh, some click operation on a button and it doesn't work, then the alternative solution that I go is I use a JavaScript executor code in my, in my, in my, in my code, actually. I use a JavaScript executor command. I'm sure, like I know, I mean, many of us. I mean, yeah. So, so yeah, let you me know. make sure. Let me make sure I, I kind of understood the question. Um, you're asking about when using uh, web element dot click, right? And it doesn't work. Correct. Uh, and so a lot of people resort to using the JavaScript executor to call the JavaScript click method on on the element or some other method for for doing that. And I guess the question is. What's the general advice about that? Or, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, is there any specific bug in the web driver which uh, doesn't support this click operation and we had to go for a .NET solution of using JavaScript executor? Because uh, when I start using the JavaScript executor on IE, the IE just starts flickering. I mean, so IE doesn't support that so, JavaScript executor. So Internet Explorer is a little bit of a strange beast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Let me, let, so, at the risk of boring everyone in the room with, with technical details, um, by default, uh, the Internet Explorer driver uses what are called native events. Now, does everybody know what native events are? Okay, for those of you that don't, what that means is that we're actually using an OS level mechanism, a Windows level mechanism to simulate the click on in the browser, uh, as opposed to simulating it by using JavaScript. Um, now that causes a number, there are a number of potential gotchas with that, with doing that with, in, in Internet Explorer specifically. Uh, a lot of them are focus related. Uh, I've got a couple of blog posts that talk about some of the problems that are endemic to using that. Um, there are a couple of solutions that you can try that may or may not work given the specific case. Um, I can say that um, clicking on an element that has some JavaScript hooked up to the on-click event is not globally broken in the IE driver. Um, it's not broken for every website everywhere um, because we have you know, 700 unit tests, some of which actually do click on an element uh, that, launch, that, that runs JavaScript, uh, and those are passing at completely in uh, the, the web driver's continuous integration in our CI system. And, those, and it runs on every version of Internet Explorer from 6 to 11, and it routinely passes with, with no problem. Um, it still runs on 6. It does. It still runs on 6. It's not, it's not supported, but we still run it on 6. Um, so there may be something else interacting with the system, whether it's something unique to the JavaScript widget library that you're using, that it's doing something sort of non-standard or, or unique uh, in the click event uh, that, may be, that, that maybe Internet Explorer or the driver is not working correctly with, or uh, it could be, again, a focus issue, um, and I can explain at length as to why that, that is, is a problem. Um, uh, 
again, there are some there are some some solutions that you can try in that case, and I would encourage you to check out uh, some of the blog posts that are out there that do have them. You could turn off native events. You could try the require window focus uh, capability, which uses a different native events mechanism, one that's more supported and more correct by Microsoft. Um, uh, but I can also it, it's not completely broken. I think uh, the big point is, or the big thing to consider when you deal with these problems is every single browser driver is implemented differently. And it's most of them are hacks on top of hacks on top of hacks, like Jim can attest, right? <laughs> it's the nature of the beast. We're driving things that are, we're not meant to be automated, and we're doing it anyways because it's too useful, right? I think the direction that the project is going is the only way to address this problem completely, and is let the browsers do the work of automating themselves. So when you tell them to make a click, they will do it at the right level, and this is why in Google Chrome, you will, you will find way less incidents of these issues than you will in Firefox or in iDriver, just because it's a native implementation by the browser vendor. It's not gonna be perfect, of course, nothing's perfect, but it's definitely better maintained than anything any of us can do without the control of the whole tool that you're driving. So it is gonna be addressed, but keep in mind that a test that passes on IE without issues may have problems in Firefox, or even worse, in different versions of Firefox, you'll get different behavior when it comes to clicks because of the native versus synthesized events, and keep that in mind. At the end of the day, JavaScript is the ultimate uh, workaround, I guess, around it. Thank uh, you. It's worth noting that, uh, I mean, what you're describing is probably a bug. And uh, as, I mean, for me as a, as a browser implementer, it's difficult to get that driver implementation up to the level of, uh, of the other drivers unless we have tests for it. So if that's, that's a real problem, I mean, the way that we're implementing drivers in the, in, in the browser is by running them against the Selenium test suite. So unless the Selenium test suite is, is good enough, uh, the drivers aren't going to be very good either. Yeah, I'm just gonna piggyback on that one, one well, just to say, um, that we that the biggest challenge when we see reports about this in the issue tracker, uh, we, you know, we get a lot of reports in the issue tracker of this doesn't work in this particular browser, um, and the next thing that we have to have is we have to have a test case that we can use to reproduce because you may be using uh, Bootstrap or you may be using AngularJS, or you may be using jQuery UI, or you may be using ext.js, or you may be using any number of, uh, of 100 different JavaScript widget frameworks, and we just don't have all of those widget frameworks in place to be able to create a simple test case, whereas, um, you know, the person who, is, uh, who, who has found the issue is in a far better position to say, this is the problem that I'm seeing, and I'm seeing it on this page that, that I see, that, that I see um, using this widget toolkit. Um, and having a reproducible test case that includes not only Selenium code, but a sample page against which we can test. That is the piece that a lot of people forget. Um, you know, the Selenium code that you're running that you're seeing the problem with is not enough. We have to have a page to test against that includes the CSS and the JavaScript, whatever it is, that, um, that, that uh, to help us reproduce the problem. Now, I know that for a lot of people that is, hey, the thing I'm working on is confidential or it's, uh, or I, it, it's only hosted on my intranet, it's not accessible from outside or, uh, or so on and so on. There are strategies that you can use to help to generate or create a test case uh, for us in that. And uh, I think probably the single most popular uh, or one of the most popular posts from, from my blog talks about, um, a little bit rudely, but it talks about um, why it's important and some of the things that you can do to help generate those test cases or help to, to provide the, the information that we need to be able to first reproduce the problem and then see what we can do about fixing it. Okay, um, so my question is uh, related to um, Morning Simon, you mentioned that uh, we, we need people to contribute to the documentation of uh, Selenium WebDriver. Now as a community, you would have seen that uh, Selenium project has grown a lot 
and it is mostly because uh, there are few good pe number of people who are good at uh, getting the stuff done they are committing to the code and there are a lot of people who actually know how to use this stuff so they are blogging about it there are few books about it and there are videos about it now what i feel is that um, we could have lot more people contributing the pro to the project in case you have a development uh, centered blog where you people contribute and write articles on how exactly let's say you fixed a bug which which could tell people that if you are looking to commit to this particular uh, or you want to contribute to this then this is the way to go about it and because there are a lot of different technologies involved it is very difficult to get that kind of a knowledge for everyone so if maybe for uh, taking this project further if we can have let's say a development blog which is on selenium where all contributors can come up and maybe write one article just and which which teaches people like us who are not too much into development can contribute to uh, this so we we are capable to learn stuff but it it is not always easy to get everything that okay this is the way we should go about these things sure um so a blog is a really good idea unless it goes quiet because no one ever posts to it like my personal i'm not a very quiet person you may have noticed this but my blog has been quiet for like months because life just gets on top of you right and you never post to it a central blog that everyone everyone contributes to um there is a lot of documentation in the wiki like the if you go to googlecode.com slash p selenium um you will find a wiki there and we tend to put user uh, developer facing documentation um in there so if you ever want to know like why is this all doing this right that that would be a good place to start um there's also quite a long chapter in the architecture of open source application book which describes the architecture of the firefox driver um chunks of the ie driver <coughs> um and it's similar to the one that's used by the chromium chromium driver as well um and explains like why we made those choices and how we made those choices um there's also the you know fix a bug become a contributor workshop which we run every single selenium conf where we do a guided walk through the source code um take a look at what needs fixing uh walk you through like how to do a build why our build tools are as mad as they are um all the bits and pieces that that would help um so there is quite a lot of developer focused documentation the next thing that would be super super useful is um possibly a video of a guided walk through of like I'm fixing a bug which uh I know Santi found it quite useful in the in the become a committer workshop where he goes like I haven't ever seen you actually walk through the source code so maybe a video tutorial like that would be good um but the way that we've grown most of the committers almost everyone on the stage is through quite a lot of interaction on the IRC channel and in the mailing lists um and over code reviews like the the best way to to start getting to to start fixing things is to go like I need help getting started where do I look and we point people in like the right direction and we try and guide them and help them because like you can have all the esoteric knowledge in the world we could we could tell you how code is laid out we could explain why it's done that way but until you get your hands dirty and start like actually experiencing the full horror of trying to navigate this thing then you know you you don't get that experiential learning and and that's the thing that helps you go from um I want to help to actually being able to help so I'm not saying no to the idea of a developer focused blog I think it's a really good idea but I think um like we need to augment the current stuff that we have before that becomes the next logical step I think a great start is to actually uh put all the things that you just mentioned in paper and make uh I think there's already a wiki page saying uh if you want to become a contributor or if you want to help out these sort of steps to follow if any of these things are missing there uh adding them up would be great it's again a wiki page so anyone can uh contribute and send a pull request or whatever that is um but i think clarity are, and documentation are are always the pain points in open source projects right <laughs> people are doing this for free and they have a limited amount of time they have a day job to commit to so 
people helping out from outside on that and whoever gets understanding of something and contributing as much as possible uh, is always helping out in that area. And uh, Simon touched on, on this briefly uh, a moment ago, but I just want to reiterate uh, that if you have you know, questions that you have as you're running it, if, if, you're, if you're wanting to start digging into the code, you're, you're not finding the resources that you need to figure out how to get started, uh, the easiest and quickest and fastest way to get that information is to hop on our IRC channel. I know I'm on the IRC channel virtually every weekday. Um, I know uh, David Burns is there very often. I know Andreas here is there every day. Uh, we're on the IRC channel, and I don't think we're that intimidating a bunch to, to chat with there. I mean, maybe a little bit, but... <laughs> But yeah, it's such it's so quiet. Now we're we're a fairly social social bunch there, so uh, you know we won't we won't yell at you. I promise. Much. Much. So it, there are actually logs of the IRC channels. I mean, you'd be right, except we actually have logs, um, but they're completely unfiltered, right? So <laughs> the history is all there. All you need to do is read every single line of every <laughs> single log. Um, or just ask a question, right? Like, we, we tend to be relatively patient, and we all have terrible short-term memory. So if you just come in and ask the same question repeatedly, you've probably got like a week before we actually remember that it's you asking that question. And the other problem is uh, typically, and it is the rule of thumb, and what I found out personally myself is that people who tend to um, write code are the worst people to try to communicate anything in writing. And um, uh, it, it feels like we would, we would need somebody who is not a technical user to come in and start asking questions and write down answers in a human language to make the documentation actually understandable. Yeah, so uh, about the logging first, you can actually type uh, colon logging and then enter in your RC client and you'll pay, get, uh, get the link to all of the logs. Um, Santi and I started the project last year in Conf about rewriting the docs. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that didn't really uh, get much traction. <laughs> uh, but we, uh, we did actually get somewhere with it. So we, we do have like a, a preliminary uh, draft of at least two or three chapters of doc new documentation. Because uh, I agree that uh, uh, a fair amount of the documentation on docs.selenium.hq uh, are, uh, it, it, it's fairly bad. Um, but uh, you can also see that uh, the number of people who are active contributors on the Selenium project, we're, we're not that many people. So, and we're limited by, by, by life, basically. Uh, we, I mean, we need, uh, we need more of you to, uh, to join us and to, uh, to help us out with not only fixing bugs, but also writing documentation. So if you go back to the original Selenium Conf, we actually had a team of people who contributed to the project by just writing documentation. And we loved them, and they used to come up on the stage with us and things like that. Um, and yeah, that, that team faded away. Uh, I was one of those. Yeah, Santi was one of those. Th that team mostly faded away, except, except for Santi, who apparently absorbed all of them. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's how I started in the project. And we basically, basically got started because we, we noticed that the project needed documentation, needed someone who understood the tool to write about it. And it was one of the biggest learning experiences I had. I definitely learned so much about Selenium by writing about it and by having to ask these people, hey, how does this really work? Uh, the documentation that you find in docs.seleniumhq.org were actually written when Selenium 2 did not exist. And we're talking about Selenium 3 being promised a year ago, and Selenium 2 was released, I don't know, four years ago or more? 2011. 2011, okay, yeah, four years. Uh, so yeah, the docs could definitely use some help. Um, I was thinking about doing some sort of weekend effort to get them published, and then I think they would get a lot more contribution, but it's open source, so no promises. You know, we could just hide, us, hide someone in a room with a keyboard, and if someone wants to come and hack with us on documentation tomorrow, maybe we could do that. Would that be interesting for people? Would you like to do like a documentation hackathon or something in like a quiet space tomorrow? Or not? 
Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll, I'll have a chat with Naresh and we'll see whether we can find a space for that. Because that would be fun. And we'll announce it tomorrow if it's happening. No promises. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ming. I'm from Car Sales and Australian classified ad company selling automobiles of cars. Um, first, I want to thank Jim Evans because when I when I saw Brother, I know somebody would come up with a framework to automate the testing, but I, I wasn't just not I, I wasn't so sure whether there's going to be some people to make it available to C Sharp. So that's pretty good. <laughs> Um, my question is, like, I'm QA, you guys are developers, so I have a different thought. When I look at, uh, uh, I'm pretty good at finding bugs, so um, when I look at it, sometimes I found bugs from Selenium or the bindings or um, things. So uh, my question is, I look at it, I, I, I thought, like, it would be great if somebody create a website with the most of the scenarios people need to automate, and then you guys can just uh, develop a suite, or I can develop a suite. So we just run new software on that, on that website. And then if we didn't pick up something people complain about, we just add another page with AngularJS or something and... Do it. That, it would that help? It might help. Um, there's, there, are, have, uh, there have been suggestions about something like that in the past. Um, I do know of at least one. Is Dave Hafner in the room? Dave, are you here? I know he's at the conference. I don't see him around. Um, he might be sleeping. <laughs> um, he, has a, he has a project called The Internet, uh, which is, uh, and, and uh, I believe the, the, the name of his website is Elemental Selenium. Is that the name of it? Am I getting that right? Which has a series of tips, and, and, and his... That project was designed to be sort of the, uh, here's, here's a, a thing, a project that, uh, that has as part of it a lot of really common things that people need to do that they have trouble doing. Uh, and I know that he takes contributions to that particular project as well, but I mean it's things like dealing with pop-up windows and which people always seem to have challenges with. Or things like um, waiting for elements to appear on a page. There, he's got an example there of how to go about doing that. Um, uh, I do know that all of his examples are developed in Ruby, uh, so it might be worthwhile doing a port of that or a port of that code to other languages. That might be useful or helpful. Um, you know, I, I would, I would I would take a look at that and see if that has at least some of the kinds of things that you're looking at asking about and maybe offering to do guest contributions. I know I know I asked him if I could, you know, I, I saw that a lot of people were having trouble with how to pop up windows is the one I know because that's the one I happen to have said, I know people have trouble with this. Would you like to have an example that shows how to do this? And I gave him some sample code and, and he put it up there as, and, and did it as part of one of his elemental selenium tips. So I know that he takes contributions from, from, from third parties for people who run into common solutions that a lot of people seem to run into. I think that, that's a bit different because I want to create a website to test your work, like yeah. different um, scenarios and... Uh, so back in the day, there used to be a test case in the old Selenium RC test suite that did this and it was constantly broken. Like, no, no one was maintaining it, and it was only ever one run when there was a release, and there was a release every mega decade or something like that. <laughs> <clears throat> um, if there was a suite that was actively maintained by people, uh, you know, I'd love to, to run that, right? And just find out when things were breaking, and we could point, point it at source labs, and we could, we could stick it in part of our continuous integration server and stuff like that. I haven't got the time or the energy or the capacity to write and maintain that. If you do, go for it, and we will link to it, and we will run it, and I'll be pleased as punch to do that. Like, that would be brilliant. Um, but it's not something we're against. It's just like, I don't think we've got the capacity to do it as a project ourselves. And uh, be aware, because it's, uh, it's a very extensive project. It feels like it'd be easy at the beginning, where you build a form field and a few buttons and click around in some Ajax. But reality is that 
you will have to build a massive application where you can do any sort of interaction that Selenium already does. I believe our test suite does have a few pages with every single HTML uh, form type or field that, that you can have, and it's extensive. It's a lot of work to do it. If you m wanna make it functional and add some server-side code behind that, uh, it's, not a, it's not gonna be a one, two-day project, but it'd be a huge contribution for sure. Hi guys, good evening. And uh, so myself, Karth again, and I work for Obla. And uh, once again, uh, I take this opportunity to thank you all for hosting here uh, over in India. And we are really pleased to have you all here. And uh, my question is like, uh, yes, I do agree. It's an open source project, and we have a uh, lot of uh, painful moments. And uh, but uh, are we going to stick with the same plan of uh, having the um, in? Uh, my, uh, my ambition or my interest is, my curious, curiosity is all about why don't we have a community or something like JCP, you know, right? Uh, how Java evolves itself by the community. Something like if we want to increase the uh, base of Selenium contributors so that you guys are not supposed to take the always blame for a, uh, what I call postponing the releases. So do we have a plan for driving uh, people to contribute back to Selenium? Because we all use Selenium and we all interested. I know uh, we all have certain wiki pages and we all those things are happening. But the, I feel like these are uh, separated and uh, if we have, uh, in simple words, if we have, an, uh, why don't we have, an, uh, is it, I mean not, uh, is it possible to have a board or something for an uh, education? Because when I compare with other open source projects like Linux foundations, or uh, open uh, open source or something, they have uh, their own develop uh, developers contributors themselves, and also they part of them are used to uh, contribute on educating their products and uh, videos and everything that will be done. Also, they'll be a part of a uh, community will keep encouraging people to contribute and way. But anyway, but that's not our individual contributor's job. It may be like that. But if you start driving that, because if Simon is not well on a particular week, the delay should not be, uh, I mean, uh, the release should not be delayed or something like. Uh, we should be, uh, we feel we also should be accountable for um, future Selenium. So is, uh, do, uh, is there any plan for increasing the Selenium committers? Uh, in terms of numbers or something like that? Or is it possible to have a community-based, a commu uh, official community on con continent or uh, country base so that they can educate their local audiences as well? They drive people to contribute back to Selenium in terms of documentation or a hackathon or whatever it may be. Thank you. So, uh, excellent question. Um, I think I understood it. If I'm wildly <laughs> off base, if I'm wildly off base, do let me know. So um, it's about, uh, the question is basically about like how have we got a plan to grow contr contributions um, and contributors. So there's a number of things that we, that we have already in place to try and, and bootstrap that. One of them is conference, th this conference where we, we run the workshop um, and there are people who come to that and every year we get one or two people starting to sort of chip away at bugs and stuff like that. Um, and actually that's phenomenal. That's, that's a huge payback uh, for, for the time and investment that that takes. The, uh, one of the things we've done is we've marked up some of the bugs on the bug tracker as getting involved. So these are bugs where you're not expected to have a huge amount of experience with the project, but you're interested in getting, getting your teeth into it and like, well, we think this bug won't be too hard to do. So if you just go to the bug tracker and just pick out one of the getting involved, that's a good place to go. One of the other things we did is we moved from Subversion as a source control system to Git, and then we mirrored ourselves onto GitHub. So um, one of the, the primary drivers for that, I was told, was that it would enhance the number of contributions we have. Um, and we handle pull requests, like I, I landed a pull request uh, in, the, in, the, in the workshop yesterday, actually. Um, there is a process in place for doing that. Um, and that's a fairly standard model in the open source world. Moving up a level, one of the things that we have is uh, user group evenings in quite a few cities around the world. I know there's one in San Francisco, I know there's one in London, um, there's probably, I think there's one in Berlin as well. Um, those are the ones that I'm aware of. There's one in Tel Aviv, San Jose. Amsterdam, San Jose, they're all over the world, right? Um, if we're in town and there is a Selenium group meeting, 
then I think all of us are more than happy to meander along and talk about anything that, that the local Selenium community would find useful or interesting. Like, it's one of the things that I enjoy doing when I'm in town. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I really enjoy Selenium Conf, right? It's this opportunity to connect with the community. Um, so those are the sort of things that we've got in place. On top of that, it would be nice if there was like a developer evangelist for the Selenium project who walked around and sort of explained why it was awesome and great and wonderful. Uh, but, and we'd do that if we were a company, but we're not a company. We're an open source project of you know, people who work in their free time and maybe some of us are lucky enough for our, our companies to sponsor our work. Um, but we are relatively small. If, if you are, by the way, really keen in becoming like uh, an evangelist, come and have a chat and at least we can figure out like the messaging and how we should do things and stuff like that. Um, but notice it's an open source project. It hasn't, it's got like some money, but not a huge amount. And we use that normally to put on the conference and run it as low a cost as we can. Um, so, I, yeah, it's not going to make, you're never going to get rich from doing it. Uh, I just want to throw so, uh, something out here. Uh, some of the people keep prefixing their question with, I'm not a developer, I'm a QA. Um, that's what I used to do, and I still do, because I'm not a developer, I'm just, uh, but there is no reason for you not to try to go fix a bug. Even if you don't know, I, I, a year ago I didn't know Java, I, I hated it, I still hate it, but I didn't know it, now I know it a little bit. And uh, I needed to fix a very frustrating bug that I found in the grid and I decided to just go and learn it. And on one hand I am contributing to the project and making the project better, which is great. And on the other hand, I am padding my resume for the next job, so just throwing it out there. Hello, everybody. I'm gonna, sorry, yeah. I'm gonna try and do a quick lightning round. Uh, I see a few people moving out, so I thought I'll do a quick lightning round and then pass it back. So Can I'll take my last question before that. Go ahead, yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Rahul, and uh, most of my experience goes into mobile applications. Uh, my question is basically different from what the questions were here. Uh, the fact I'm here is there were a few talks on the mobile side and that's the reason I'm here which interests me and as you all know most of the work is getting inclined towards the mobile side. So my question to the panel is what kind of focused approach or what kind of a roadmap you have or is there any specific focus at the mobile application automation side from Selenium? So from the Selenium project itself the main thing we're doing to help uh, the, the, the roadmap with mobile which I mentioned this morning, um, is that we're hosting the work to do with trying to specify how a mobile implementation of WebDriver should work. Um, that's available in one of the sub-projects. If you just go to the seleniumgooglecode.com and take a look at the, the source code, you can find that. Um, ultimately, that work will probably lead to a specification, but that is some way down the track. That's the only, that's the main thing we're doing as a project for mobile. Um, and that's because the mobile implementations are hosted up by Appium, by Celandroid, and iOS Driver, and BlackBerry. The, uh, the, these, these guys have more time, more energy, and more enthusiasm for solving the particular platform, the problems of the particular platforms they're targeting, rather than the Selenium project, which tends to do a lot of, of desktop stuff. Now, that doesn't mean we're not interested in mobile. It just means that we think that those guys are already adding all the value that we would want to be adding ourselves and going in there and stealing their, stealing their thunder and going like, oh no, the official way of doing Android is this way isn't helping anyone, right? We want to grow a community. We want to grow a, a suite of related sister projects who um, get along well and where it's possible to like flip in an implementation if it's not quite right. Um, does anyone else want to say anything? Uh, well, remembering that the Chrome driver works on um, KitKat these days, and I suspect Firefox have some plans for mobile as well. So the mobile browser providers have also got an opportunity to add those implementations. Yeah, we already have, um, have working internally uh, at Mozilla anyways. Uh, 
Marionette running on, on real devices uh, that's being used every single day, actually. I think the challenge for the Selenium project is sort of bringing all of these different solutions from all of the vendors together. And I think that's where we've made the step in the right direction with the WebDriver spec, which is, which is coming. Um, if you want to know more about the WebDriver spec, you should attend my talk tomorrow. Um, <laughs> But um, uh, before we can start working really on, on publishing and suggesting or proposing a, uh, a mobile spec, we need to make sure that we have level one finished first. And that really means getting the basics of, of WebDriver nailed down in the W3C WebDriver spec. Uh, because the level one of the WebDriver spec isn't necessarily desktop oriented because most of the most of the functionality that we put into the spec is specifically not desktop specific, or it's specifically not desktop specific. So um, things like uh, geolocation, things like notifications, full screen support, all of these web APIs, they're not in the WebDriver spec consciously. So we're, we're sort of planning on adding those on top mm -hmm. of the WebDriver spec once that's done. Uh, uh, as sort of extensions to, to the spec. And that also applies, uh, I suspect, to sort of some parts of the mobile spec. How, how far, like, is it very near? Like, you're saying you're going to implement that part. So is it, the, what, what is the aggressive plan? You're going to do it in within six months, one year? Is there any timeline to that? Uh, can you repeat? Is there any timeline to introduce all the, uh, maybe the geotagging or all those kind of uh, web driver part? You have any roadmap to? Like, like timelines for that, or is it like left to? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, so, uh, I, I mean, I'd love for there to be a to be a roadmap, but uh, the, I mean, the reality is that every one of us works for companies which have different priorities, and uh, uh, a specification and things like that. It takes time, and it's not something that you can force. It's something that will come naturally when, when, when everyone agrees. And uh, um, specification processes are, are, are not the most agile beasts in, uh, you've ever dealt with. So hopefully we'll get WebDriver finished first and then we'll see what happens. Maybe we can revisit this question. Yeah, I understand, you don't want to commit a date here, right? Thank you. Well, this is kind of the way it works, right? You find a problem, then you build multiple solutions around it, and then you pick whichever is the best solution. You learn from the mistakes, and then you spec on it, right? These meetings are not fun. They're definitely not fun. It's hours like of getting, <laughs> getting together. <laughs> um, but yes, you have implementations like Appium and iOS Driver and Solendry that are solving these problems today, right? So they are implementing solutions for geolocation, notifications, Wi-Fi controls, all these things that you would not even think about from the Selenium side. Uh, once these implementations are in place and we find the problems with each of them, we can come up with a spec that ultimately the future of all these tools uh, is to be part of the platform that they're meant to automate, right? Appium should go away as well. iOS drivers should go away as well as soon as Apple or Google provide the right toolkit that the community wants to use to automate their platforms. There's no reason for us to maintain it, right? We only, all we want is a single spec that we can all stick to so that we don't have to be rewriting our tests every six months when a new, when a new tool comes up or a new need comes up. Also, yeah. don't forget that the, the modern web was born in, what, 1996, and it took until 2005 before Selenium RC came out. It took until 2011 before Selenium 2 came out. So you're talking a decent wedge of time as we um, experimented with the medium, gathered more experience, figured out what felt right and what felt wrong, um, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not thinking it's gonna take that long on mobile because sort of the, the timelines are compressed and we're learning more and more. But right now, we're going through a period of experimentation of like, what does it feel like to write a proper framework for um, a, a mobile device? And we think it, it feels natural to build on top of the WebDriver model of sort of an um, API for navigating a tree of nodes and interacting with those nodes. But we're still working on the details. And I think it's gonna take a little bit of um, 
interesting work and, and sort of cre uh, creative solutions that are coming out of the community to figure out what that looks like. And when we've done that, like when we've beaten all the rough edges out of it, when we know what feels good, like Santi says, we'll be able to just move forward with, with a more collaborative approach. Um, I'll just pick up on that and compare outside Selenium. If you look at things like Calabash and Frank, those are two open source projects that um, help with native test automation and they borrow from each other and they build together with each other and they now have integrated in part the two projects. Given that all this is open source, the nice thing is even with multiple implementations or even especially with multiple implementations, we can copy the good ideas. So it's much easier for people to innovate in this space than would otherwise be the case. And of course, you're welcome to join in. There's plenty of projects that will take your commits. Thank you. Thank you for taking the question. All right, fantastic. So I'm going to try and do a lightning round. A lightning round? Lightning round, the way it works is I'm going to. Okay. Which last one? Ah, this one. So the idea behind the lightning round is basically I have seven questions here. Uh, I'm going to shoot one question. Everyone gets to answer the question and you answer the question in a word, in a phrase, or in a line at the max, <coughs> right? And we go through everyone, one question, then I ask the next question, we go through. So hopefully we'll be done in seven minutes or less, <laughs> right? And Is that one of the questions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's a common question you really wish people stop asking you? <laughs> when? Can I have status codes, please? <laughs> Selenium ID, can I use it? <laughs> uh, can you help me write a bot that will play with money at this casino website? Can you fix my problem, full stop? I think I'm gonna go with stale element exceptions. Uh, that's a pretty common one that it's a tough one to explain. Not to put anyone in this pot, having asked that question in this conference. All right, cool, thanks. So the next one is, what's the worst idea ever, anyone ever suggested on the Selenium project? The worst idea. <laughs> Just one more drink. <laughs> HTTP status codes? <laughs> <laughs> um, replacing the entire WebDriver API with something that's modeled uh, in uh, an object-oriented form after the DOM. Uh, we need to test on IE5. Can you just help with the Python bindings in 2007? <laughs> well, I'm shocked no one said this one, but uh, iterations in Selenium ID. Come on, you guys. <laughs> What's your favorite programming language? It depends. Java with an IDE that's good, or English. <laughs> I should go really nerdy and say something like Fortran or COBOL. But no, I'm a big fan of C-sharp, actually. Yeah, I mean, I believe in the right tool for the right job. But uh, if I had to pick today, I think it's probably Go. I should say Rust, probably, because I've worked with Zola, but <laughs> not really. Uh, Toss-up between Visual Basic and PowerShell, no? Uh, ah. uh, just shell, bash script. Never, uh, never underestimate what you can get accomplished with a simple bash script. Good point. I can write some Java, so I'll say Java. <laughs> I will not say Java. Um, Python. 
do you hate about selenium? <laughs> I thought I'd be done by sort of early 2008. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be dragging on a bit. I hate feeling like I'm not doing a good enough job. Do you need a hug? <laughs> <laughs> not at the moment, but I'll take a rain check. I'll jump in and say the bearded one. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not contributing enough, really. I'd love to do more. I think the fact that it's solving a really, really hard project, it's a, it's a complicated tool and project to be a part of. It's not just a nice UI framework out there or not to the minute uh, those efforts, but it, it's a hard problem to address for sure. Yeah, I'm going to answer uh, something I'm working on right now. Uh, uh, so I was working on uh, getting the Selenium uh, remote server working, and I'm just getting null pointer exceptions everywhere. And it's just so terribly written. So if someone wants to fix our bugs, please go ahead, because there are plenty <laughs> of them. OK, let me change it. Uh, the fact that the companies that will pay $17,000 for a professional tool per computer are not willing to donate that money to the project instead. If you had the time machine and you could go back in time, which was the one browser you would kill? <laughs> it would be one of the variants of Lynx, because I can never remember which one was good and which one was bad. <laughs> there was Lynx with a Y and Lynx with an I. It was a text-based browser. I'm showing my age, aren't I? I'm, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> Which browser would I kill? I don't know if I'd kill any browser. If I could go in a time machine, I'd probably stop Selenium RC from being invented. <laughs> <laughs> and just go straight to web, web driver. Yeah, I mean, uh, I used to work for another browser vendor who decided to, uh, to, to chuck their, uh, their browser engine on, on, on the scrapyard. So I'm probably going to see the, say the new Opera. Emacs. Oh, wait, you didn't say operating system. Sorry. <laughs> I'll pass on this one. I wouldn't kill any browsers. I think the more implementations, the better for the web to be open. So, none. Cool. Thank you. Uh, what was your high point on the Selenium project? There are so many. Um, Selenium Conf every year, that's always a high point for me. Um, and when we actually do a major release, that's always a, a real kick as well. I'm going to say two. Uh, in addition to, the, to, to, to what Simon said, I think the release of Selenium 2.0 was a real high point. We, we worked really hard to get that done. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm real, I was really proud the day that I landed the rewritten IE driver, um, even as... Uh, as much trouble as it gave me over the years since. <laughs> um, so at the earlier uh, Selenium conferences, unfortunately he's not here today, but uh, there used to be a running joke that we, uh, we would always buy Yadi Bakken, who's written the Ruby bindings, a stake as big as his head. So I think probably the highlight of the Selenium project is meeting him in 2011 in San Francisco at a uh, Indian Irish bar. <laughs> Indian Irish and, and watching Yari eat a steak literally as big as his head. Uh, but uh, from, from joke to, uh, to seriousness, I think um, uh, probably being the fir writing the first web driver implementation uh, supported by a browser and also being the one to write the first implementation for a mobile device. Uh, a piece of JavaScript that would catastrophically crash, i.e. 8 and 9, <laughs> that was caught in CI and did not go on into production. 
Uh, two things, one, working on the Wave projects, which I helped out in peripherally. It was just staggering to see how good WebDriver was at dealing with this very complex application. And then the first mobile implementations. Seeing WebDriver actually running on a mobile phone was pretty staggering back in, what, 2008? Around 2008 we did that. I think getting Selenium on continuous integration was, uh, was a very big high for me. Uh, working with Daniel Wagner Hall for most of the work, but helping out from the soft side on, on how to do all those tweaks was uh, a very big one. And my second highest was fixing a very, very complicated bug in SSL uh, proxying in Selenium. I spent like an, a week and a half digging through the weeds of encryption and working with the people at Bouncy Castle to the point that I actually got a bug. And of course it was three lines of code, which is, <laughs> which is the way it always is. But nailing that one was, was a good one. Last question. What's your worst nightmare with the Selenium project? You know, I don't think I have one. Like, I got into the Selenium project because I enjoy hacking on the code, and I'm always going to enjoy hacking on the code. I guess my worst nightmare would be having the project end and never having an opportunity to hang out with the team and you guys. I think my worst nightmare would probably be having the project end without seeing the spec work through and without seeing uh, the browser, the work we've done with the browser vendors come to full fruition, that would probably be my worst nightmare. Yeah, I'm going to uh, say the same thing as Jim, actually. Um, we've worked so hard on the Selenium project over the years, so it would be a shame to not see it sort of culminate in this, uh, this specification, which is sort of, we keep pushing forward and it's so hard to get right. So uh, I'm going to answer, answer that. Uh, having to test a Flash application with Selenium. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obtuse implementations. So now we're getting a spec. Let's hope that everyone implements it consistently and reliably. Yeah, I think uh, I'm going to go with browser vendors not respecting the spec and doing their own thing way the web, the web is kind of made these days uh, would be a really, really bad thing. All right. Thank you, guys. That was great. Thank you. There are a few more people who have questions. We have time till 7. We need to kill. So if you guys are okay, we're going to continue for a bye. Good. I've got half an hour to make up from earlier. <laughs> so 7.30. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I actually got a second. Last of my question is, why is it called Selenium? Ah. ah. A very good question. An interesting story. Are we sitting comfortably, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> then I'll begin. Huggins here. Yeah, Jason Huggins or Paul Hammond yeah. um, tell the story far better than I do, but I'll have a stab at it. <clears throat> so, um, Jason Huggins was the original creator of what we now call Selenium. And... Uh, He's fairly creative with names, but I think he was going to call it like a framework for doing automated testing on a web browser and it's going to be wicked good or something. Boring. I don't know. Um, but he was, they were come, trying to come up with names for it. Um, and somebody sort of went, well, you know, what, 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 what is it competing against? And somebody went, oh, it's competing against like uh, uh, Mercurial QTP. And somebody, you know, looked in the dictionary. I think it was Jason looked in the dictionary and sort of looked up Mercurial and, and, and found out that the cure for mercury poisoning was selenium. <laughs> and so it started off as a really bad joke and then it was like, it's one of those names that stuck because actually it's a really good name, right? And it's memorable and it's distinctive and it's easy to find. Um, also, if you're interested in Brazil nuts, it turns out, they're high in selenium. <laughs> Sorry, there we go. Hi, this is Prashant Sams. And I am a diehard fan of uh, Selenium, and uh, I've been waiting for this day for a long. And uh, hi, Simon. <laughs> I'm, a, I, I'm a diehard fan of you and Jim Evans. I know he is a very good uh, musician. I've been going through all the contributors' uh, biography. I am, I am very, very excited. And 
And I'm, I have a blog called salnimox.com, salnimox.blogspot.com. So especially right now, I would like to ask the question. Um, I'm, uh, it's very interesting and remarkable that uh, um, Salnim supports uh, all the most popular browsers. So especially uh, Opera and uh, Safari, in my concern, I feel a lot of issues and uh, especially Opera 12 plus versions uh, doesn't um, support and also uh, Safari, um, uh, I have tried Windows 7, it's not working. Uh, there's combinations, certain combinations, working in one machine and doesn't, doesn't support on other machine. So that's what I want to ask from you and one more question. Uh, I heard of some rumors uh, that Windows uh, with Selenium is going to be launched, but I'm not aware about that. Just heard of the rumors, rumors. Uh, so can you please? Okay, so taking the first question about like, wouldn't it be nice if the Opera driver and the Safari driver were as stable and as good as the other implementations? I totally agree, it would be nice. Um, Opera, uh, they switched their rendering engine from um, their own one to the one that's used by Chromium, which is called Blink. Um, and when they did that, there was a step back in how easy it was to automate uh, Opera. They are working on, I believe they're working on a new Opera driver. Um, so that should be coming. It won't be coming from the Selenium project. If it's coming at all, it will be coming from op Opera software. With Safari, the current implementer, I think that's enough of it. Like, <laughs> the current implementation uh, was written by a very talented engineer called Jason Labor. Um, and it's a plugin that it's an extension to Safari, which was similar to how we used to do the old Chrome driver. Um, it's a flawed approach, right, because we can't get the level of control over the browser that we really need. My sincere hope is that once we get the W3C specification um, to recommendation, which is where it's published and people uh, can implement it, my sincere hope is that Apple step up and do their own implementation. It's Apple software though, right? So. They will release this thing if they're working on it when they're good and ready, but nobody knows if they're working on it. Um, the second question about uh, Windows, applications. Windows applications, testing Windows applications yes. with Selenium. Because I heard some rumors, so I, I'm not sure. Um, just uh, thought of asking. So uh, Francois Reynard, I think, had was Twin or something. Yeah, yeah Twin was it. Francois had an implementation, and if you, I mean, if you think about, if you kind of think about it, I mean, Simon alluded to this in, 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 his, in his talk this morning. Um, if you think about a Windows application, it's a tree of objects or tree of elements, and you walk and navigate through that tree, and you interact with the nodes on that tree, very similar to a web page. Um, the model or the API model, the idea that that's what this API is, holds up, right, in terms of being able to do it. Um, is, are there any active projects that are actively working on using the Selenium project or the Selenium or the WebDriver API to automate Windows applications? Not to my knowledge, I don't think so. Um, it would be an interesting project. It would be an interesting project, but I don't know of any projects that, that are, that are currently being developed or that are even on the radar for something like that. But it would be an interesting project to, to look into. Uh, and I heard two words that should never be together used ever, which is Windows Safari testing. Um, part of the reason is that Apple has not updated Safari on Windows in more than four or five years now. So if, if you actually want to test on Safari, you should probably get an OS X node. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, uh, sorry. before asking the question, I would like to thank you guys uh, uh, for your efforts and special thanks to Jim for his uh, .NET <laughs> bindings. <laughs> okay, so uh, I have two, two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, specific to, uh, I mean, it's very technical. Uh, right now, the text that we pass to the locators, I, I suppose it's very case sensitive. Uh, is there any plan or is it possible for to make it non-case sensitive? Which locators? I mean... I all of them. Yeah, kind of. No, not all of them, but I was talking specific with the ID or something. 
ID? Uh, so what we tend to do is we tend to delegate down to the browser engine to ask it, like, have you got this thing? So um, ID, name, uh, CSS selectors, CSS selectors in particular. Um, on some browsers, most browsers, we XPath is also done natively. Yeah. Um, so whatever the browser does is what we do, and so I'm not planning on changing anything. Um, that's not the world's most helpful answer, I know. So uh, with the CSS selector in, 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 in uh, specifically, uh, that roughly equates to what you do when you call document.query selector or document.query selector all. So if you, if you really want to raise that, that issue, you need to talk to the CSS working group and uh, have good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, my next, uh, it's not a question, but it's a suggestion. Uh, first of all, uh, I really thank you guys for maintaining the document at cylindermhq.org because uh, I've seen really it going from the very beginning stages and right now it's in a very decent stage where everyone can benefit from that. Uh, but uh, it, the suggestion is more or less like uh, I've seen a lot of people talking about the uh, different kinds of patterns that they have implemented uh, uh, in their test suits. But it would be really great if, we, if they could log or document their uh, I mean, specific patterns, what they have implemented with the code snippets in the uh, in the website or the web page. That would be really helpful for the starters so that it's kind of a hub and people can come there instead of, uh, you know, doing a Google search and going on individual blocks. Does anyone want to... No, it's not a question. That, that was, was not a, a question, it was a suggestion so, to yeah. all. Could you, could you repeat the, the question bit of the question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my suggestion was uh, more, uh, more specific to the documentation that we are maintaining at the uh, selenemhq.org uh, because I've seen a lot of people talking about different types of patterns that they have been implemented. Uh, so I, I was re requesting people to come up and update their patterns in the documentation uh, section of the selenemhq.org so that it will be more useful for everyone. So it's kind of one stop for everyone to Okay, so it's a request for us to update our docs. We should do that. It's a su suggestion for everyone to contribute, I believe. Yeah, yeah it's a suggestion uh, for everyone, yeah. We, we built the docs, the new docs that Andreas and I have worked on, and Luke is also working yeah, or on. or just send the patch. I mean, th this isn't something really we can do. I mean, it, Send a pull request and yeah. we'll approve it. They're yeah. built on Markdown, which is these days the language of open source documentation, right? Everything on GitHub is Markdown. So it's really, really easy to go out there, uh, make a, big a quick change and contribute it back. So we just got to do the hook so that we can make that Markdown actually part of our website and deploy it. And that's kind of the final piece of work that uh, needs to be put in place. Okay. All right, I'm really sorry, but we will have to uh, wrap up. Uh, we have a band already here. They'll need about 30 minutes to set up so we can start on time. I know a lot of people will get late, they'll need. We have another hour tomorrow morning between nine to 10, and we can continue this tomorrow morning between nine to 10. So I'm sorry, keep your questions, great questions. We will have, we'll continue from nine to 10. We're gonna break for 30 minutes now, and I would request everyone to kind of step out or move towards the back end of this room. Uh, the band is gonna come in and they're gonna set up and then we're gonna start 7, 10-ish. Okay, um, just a quick thing. We're all gonna be here this evening. Feel free to come up and ask us questions and chat to us. Um, we're generally approachable. <laughs> and don't forget to buy Mr. Jim Evans a beer. <laughs> Thank you the, all very much. The idea much is that today. he's not supposed to walk out of this room today alone. <laughs> All right, I think we should thank these guys for their wonderful contribution.